Welcome to Words with the Wise Guy. This is our seventh podcast that we've done. This is going to be our last one of 2018. So lucky number seven sitting here next to me is Megan Welch, who recently got named the funniest person in Wichita. So no pressure. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but yeah, you better be funny. Yeah, no. I'll try. So, so how did that, tell me about the competition the Looney Bin had and I did not attend, but I heard about it and saw about it on social media. So what is this competition they had, and, and how do you win the funniest person in Wichita? So it's a, it's a competition they do every year, and I think it starts the preliminary rounds or whatever start in September. It's a long process where each Wednesday they do an open mic. You have five minutes, and then the audience, based on applause at the end of the night, uh, they select two or three comics to move into the semifinals, but the semifinals aren't until like November because you go week after week and they get like 20 comics or whatever, stack up the semifinal and then you go through the semifinals and there's some judges there and they push you through 10 people mm -hmm. and then they have like four people that get wild cards, which is just audience votes them through. And then you go to the finals and then there's judges and then they select out of those people so it's just it's, it's like march madness so if it's by audience does some knucklehead who's not funny oh, yeah. bring a bunch of friends and uh -huh. keeps advancing yeah that's there's, the it's gotta be a better way <laughs> it sucks yeah <laughs> no there <laughs> because like i've been doing comedy for almost four years now i can't find a friend left in wichita <laughs> that will come see me anymore <laughs> they're like i've been watching you do like i used to drag my friends out all the time to come watch me when i started now it's like even getting my mom out to see a show. But when you first start doing comedy, you can bring 60 people. And so, yeah, in the semifinals, they try to weed those people out in the semifinals. But you'll have someone who's never done stand-up before show up, bring 60 people, and then they're in the semifinals of Wichita's Funny. So you were like the Wichita State in March Madness, kind of the underdog yeah. against Duke in Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... So are you now where are you from? Are you from Wichita? I am. I went to I went to high school in Goddard. And then I, I moved away, went to college, Missouri Southern, and then uh ended back here and uh started doing comedy when I was almost thirty. So And what did you do before you started doing comedy? Are you doing comedy full time now? Um, not quite full time. Like I, I travel a lot and I'm on the road a lot. I have a son, so uh, I How still, old is your son? He's 10, just oh, turned 10 too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he just turned 10. So uh, Is he part of your act ever? Or yeah, ever? definitely. Yeah. That's a big part. Uh, so he comes up on stage? And <laughs> yeah. No, not quite <laughs> that much part of it. He usually just sits at the bar and waits for me to okay. get off stage. Getting started drinking yeah. Shirley, good job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's drinking Shirley Temples at the Looney Bin. If you see a little blonde-haired kid at the bar, that's yeah. my kid. So do you, what other jobs did you do in... In those jobs, were you constantly making jokes? How did you end up yeah. becoming a comedian? I, I've had, <laughs> I used to joke around before I did comedy. I started working when I was like 18, 19, whatever. I started doing, co before I started doing comedy, I had like 22 jobs I counted at one point. I was wow. constantly in and out of, like I was a school bus driver for a little bit. Uh, I worked at a liquor store. Uh, I worked on a vineyard for a little bit in Missouri. Um, like just any random, I was a janitor. Now I'm a house cleaner. I own a house okay. cleaning business. There you go. ICT Clean, if you're listening. All right, yeah. ICT yeah. Clean is a green house cleaning company, and it allows me to like, I had three days in between being in Little Rock for a week, and then I'll be in Tulsa this mm -hmm. week, starting tonight till Sunday. And then I had two days, so I come home, clean three houses, make a little cash, and then head back out. And then you came here from doing some with the radio. Yeah, what, I also what, work. What do you do with uh, I have a morning segment called My Friend Megan uh, with Phil Thompson on 104.5 The Fox. And uh, it's just, he gives me five minutes every morning to rant about something I want to rant about and make it funny. Like today, uh, we recorded one. It'll be on, I don't know when this will air, but you can find it. It's also on uh, Amazon or whatever that, hey, Google, okay. play. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, I got to talk about like killing my son's elf on the shelf. He had an accidental heroin overdose. Mm. So that was real fun to talk about. He lets me just get dark and weird on his show and then I leave. So... <laughs> Very interesting. So I'll have to dial that up. What was that name? What was that called again? It's called My Friend Megan. 
And then you were saying before we we started this that you have had a podcast. You've done podcasts before. Yeah. And you had one previously. Yeah. It wasn't as legit as this. <laughs> <laughs> it's called You Breast Believe. And it was me and a female comic named uh, Jessica Kay. And then two female artists here in Wichita, Hannah Scott and Allie Sutton. And we would just drink wine and sit around a little mic that we had set up on a coffee table and talk about. We talked about a lot Any, of like yeah yeah it was like we like to think R-rated. of it like the podcast of Broad City where we'd bring up like a usually a sexual topic and then we would talk about it and, and are these available can people go back mm-hmm. and they're still you? on iTunes and um, uh, anywhere you can get uh, Potomatic or any of those I've got a lot of driving to do over the holidays so I'm gonna dial those up yeah. and, and now the first out. couple episodes are hilarious because we didn't know each other when we first started the yeah. podcast so <laughs> we would just get. Really, you know, you know when you're drinking, but you're like around people you don't know. I don't know anything so about you, that. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just like in your head, uncomfortable and silent, just like, right. oh my god, am I being weird? Did I say something weird? So the first ones are very awkward, where we're trying to get to know each other, and then right before the podcast ends, it gets it's really good because we're friends now, yeah, and we're just it's loose, but yeah, that's so like podcasts mm-hmm. seem to yield themselves to comedians. There's so many comedians, mm-hmm. you know, Joe Rogan is the, obviously the one, the guy that has a huge following, but there's so many other comedians that have podcasts. And, uh, you know, is that because comedians obviously are entertaining and they're quick-witted and clever, but are com- I, I think of comedians being more thoughtful mm-hmm. than a lot of people maybe give them credit for. Yeah. And is that is that why podcasts are yield to comedians more than seems like anybody else? I would, I think that, uh, yeah, a comic would be, because I think as a comedian, you look at every situation, every everything in the news, and you look at it from like five different angles. Right. You know, that way, that's like everything you look at is like crafting a joke. And so there's, you don't want to look at it head on and make an easy hacky joke. You're looking at it five different ways, trying to see different sides and different viewpoints. And I think that would lend itself to being, you know, a podcast host, talking to people, talking about stories, talking about things going on in the news. Right. And also it's a good platform. I think comedians use that as a plat- the platform to be like, yeah, uh, I'm a comedian and you can also access me here, you know, like doing YouTube videos or going, trying mm-hmm. to go viral. Comedians do that a lot too. Or Yeah, it seems like, Comedian, the route to being a comedian is so much different probably now than it used to be when I was growing up. Yeah. Um, I didn't really obviously go that that route, but but getting on YouTube or getting something that's funny or viral, mm-hmm. you know, really seems to to change compared to somebody who might have had to uh, go and start out like maybe you've done over the years and work your way, you know, up mm-hmm. the ladder. Yeah. And, but if somebody puts something funny on YouTube all of a sudden they're a star. There's comedians, know. I've seen comedians coming to like the Orpheum and I was like, who is this? And I'm Googling them and they were just, uh, they just did funny videos in their car. You know, those, yeah. those, those videos with this, you're just a selfie and you're ranting about something your kid right. did. And now they're, they're playing in theaters and yeah. stuff. And I'm like, that's, it's just weird. Yeah. I don't even know. I'd, I wouldn't pay money to see that show, but I would be curious to know what kind of stand up somebody like that. Right creates without going through and doing mics and clubs and sh- shitty bars. I sh- yeah. Can I say that? Well, That's we'll let Kurt decide. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. but, you know, it is it is a lot different. Like, I, I've talked about this with old comics uh, when I open up for people who've been doing comedy since the 80s or whatever. Um, it is different now. You Every mid-sized city has a comedy scene anymore mm-hmm. it seems like it used to be like if you want to do comedy you got to move to new york or la mm-hmm. um and then clubs started popping up in the midwest and road comics started happening but then i think over time these clubs create their own comedy scene you know they're mm-hmm. developing talent right where they are like we have the looney bin mm-hmm. here in wichita so you have mics you have a way to break into the club they have a chain so you can go and do clubs in other states once you get in on that circuit but it's it's just weird now because now there's a billion people trying to be a comic. Mm-hmm. That, that old saying, like everybody's a comedian, is pretty true. Yeah. And there's every every state has a thousand comedians in it. Maybe not Kansas, but like yeah. you know. So how's Wichita? Yeah, you know, as you've traveled around as a comedy scene, how does how's Wichita stack up? We're still growing. Like uh, like I don't, I love 
the the comedy like all the comedians here that do comedy whether they've been they feel like they're all my friends and I I love the comedy scene but we've maybe maybe if you count everybody that will pop into an open mic for the year we might have 30 comics working mm -hmm. you know and out of those comics there's maybe 10 that are seriously like you know trying to do mm -hmm. comedy or writing and working traveling so uh we're small you know we're not like Kansas City's comedy right. scene but even in a big comedy scene, you could have a hundred comics and only 30 of them are, are decent, you know? Do you remember the first time that you stood up there and yeah. tried? How, what, what was that? Was that an open mic night or? It was open mic at the Looney How'd that go? It, it went good. Did it? It, it, went, it actually, it was a good, I had just gone through like a really bad breakup. And Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, I was not stable up here emotionally or mentally. And I was like, let's put this out on the stage. And I took my shoes off. I remember that. I was so nervous. I had slip on like ballet flats and I took them off. Huh. And then I didn't know what to do with the cord. So I kept wrapping it around and I paced from one side of the stage to the other. And I was just very manic. And uh, But it translated really well. I since tried to do the set that I did that night because I thought there were some solid jokes mm -hmm. in it. And it's like, no, I think you have to be pretty manic to pull this set off. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I couldn't. So I me know. and my buddies, we are idiots. And we've talked about trying to do five minutes at uh, open mic night. and And then we all have tried to sit down and write some material and it's yeah. unbelievably difficult yeah so what's your advice for someone who's trying to maybe start that and how do you know if that's going to be funny is it just your in you don't know until you're in front of people yeah. or is there some techniques as you're trying to to write material to make sure that it goes well yeah i think the best way to do it is to just like a lot of people will say well i'm conversationally funny and I guess to I keep a notebook on me, and it's like when you remember something that you're either a conversation you're in or an idea that you think makes you laugh. That's mm -hmm. first, it has to be funny to you. Right. Don't ever think I hope this makes other people laugh. Mm -hmm. Like, like you and your friends, if you think it's funny. Yeah, I'm saying something, and I'm, I'm thinking they're going to laugh, but I also know that it, it's funny to me right. or whatever. And then just write that down. I'm what some people call like a storytelling comic. I'm not telling stories. I have long form mm -hmm. like bits and prim like, or I have several jokes that will lead into like a 15 minute, you know, bit or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, which makes it hard for like competitions too. Right. You have five minutes yep. and you have one story to tell. Or if you're going to be on like Jimmy Kimmel or The Tonight Liners. Show or something, they've yeah. got like, you got one story. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, so I try to like keep that in mind that I'm going to write out a three page thing I'll, I'll end up typing it out and then I'll look at it and then I'll or put it in my notebook and then I go through and I underline where I think a laugh is supposed to be and then I look at that on my sheet with like red underline marks because you want to have if you're a storytelling comic they say you want to have a laugh every 30 seconds or if you have a longer setup the laugh has to be really big mm -hmm. if you're one liner, it's like a laugh every fifteen or whatever. Gotcha. It gets it Ronnie gets Dangerfield style. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's punchy, uh, but it's like boxing. Like if you're a one liner, you're throwing in a lot of jabs. If yeah. you're storytelling, you're you're swinging, trying to knock out every every so often. But then you look at that and you go, okay, there's only five underlines on this three page thing. Mm -hmm. I need a how can I say that idea quicker? How can I condense that? And then you just have to get in front of people and try it out. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's the thing. Sometimes I've walked in thinking, oh man, this bit's going to be really great. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then you have to try it out a hundred times right? because one audience might not give you, I've had jokes that I know have worked for two years and I go to one crowd and they're just like, mm -mm, not yeah. that one. Yeah. I think there's no replacement for like doing it. So I obviously track coach and, we can practice all the time, but until we go to a competition and line up and they shoot the gun and you compete against someone else, it's not the same. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, you can practice, you can probably stand at home in front of your mirror and mm -hmm. do jokes. And until you got there and try it, you never really figured out. So what if it doesn't go well? And not that that's ever happened to you, obviously. Yeah. Funniest person. <laughs> oh, yeah. In <laughs> but uh, what if it doesn't go well? How do you handle it? Do you go back to things you know that are going to work immediately? Or do you just kind of you s sit there and deal with it and try to dig yourself out? Have I you tell ever? the audience they're stupid. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't do that. I see a lot of comedy. I see yeah. that happens a lot. You'll see yeah. someone like 
they're just they're just eating shit and and then they look out at the audience and they're like you guys are idiots <laughs> i've seen someone flip off the audience after yeah. a set and walk off don't do that it's not going to go well <laughs> a lot it's, especially when you're working a new bit you're going to have to work it so many times and yeah. get the wording down just right so i think you just keep trying it you just stand up there don't let them think you think you're struggling, you know, right. like if that's the one thing I try to do when I know they're not laughing, I try to sell that. It's like, whatever, I don't, mm -hmm. it's not bothering me. Right. Just like, Oh, you, you, you don't think this is funny. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> you guys need to drink more. <laughs> so have you gotten heckled much? What do you, what do you have comebacks right away? Here's what I'm asking. So I, I coach about 30 kids mm -hmm. and guys and girls, and I get heckled every day at track practice. Oh, yeah. I need some good zingers. <laughs> like, what's my strategy <laughs> to come back to these 18 to 22-year-olds? A, a good singer for an 18 to 22-year-old. <laughs> I'm trying to think. They There's always stock lines you can old, say with hecklers yeah. or whatever. Like, yeah. this is a TV. I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that would work at track practice. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Anything, just go go for their throat. That's what I... The thing about hecklers is sometimes you have to let them heckle for a little while. Yeah. You can't just shut them down right. immediately because you don't want the audience. That's like a, a heckling situation is very, it's uh, very fragile because yeah, could turn. They're bad. an asshole for interrupting you. Yeah, and for trying to make this about them when it's obviously about me. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want to turn on them so fast that the audience goes, "Whoa, she's." She's mean. I don't right. like her. Yeah. And so you gotta you gotta kinda handle them with kid gloves for a while until like it gets to a situation where, you know, you don't anymore, you know. Mm. Um and then you can just go for their throat. I was in Topeka a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, and uh there was a lady in the front row and I was going last and sh she was heckling the entire show. Some comics chose to ignore it because mm -hmm. they just because it can get you way off. Right. You don't want them to win in a battle, so sometimes it's better to try to go around them if you can. But then by the comic before me, I was backstage listening, and she had gotten him so far off pace that I was like, I can't let her do this to me. So my first joke, I come out, and I, I don't even get to the punchline. I'm setting it up. I'm like 10 seconds into it, and then she yells out, bullshit. Just she's drunk too. Mm -hmm. the most hecklers are. They're yeah. drunk. They don't even. And then I lose it on her, and I'm yelling at her, <laughs> and I just snap, and I'm telling her to shut, you know, explicitory yeah. up, and I'm, and then at some point I'm just. It's like, it's like seeing your parents fight too. You know, you don't. Nobody likes watching their parents fight. Right. You know, but at some point I'm snapping. I'm walking out towards her table because <laughs> oh. she's got a whole family that's backing her up now. <laughs> And I can't get back on track. I know she won't yeah. let me, so I have to go all in. And at some point, I'm telling her I'm going to put my boot down her throat. And then she's telling me to try it. And now I'm like, oh, crap. Is this how this is going to uh -oh. end? Do I have to physically? Yeah. Like, now I'm going to look like an idiot if I don't put my boot down her throat. And this is probably <laughs> going to go on YouTube from somebody's exactly. phone. Exactly. Yeah. I've seen there's great heckler videos out yeah. there. Uh, but eventually, it just it, then I start turning it into comedy, you know, and I'm yeah. roasting them. I'm like, you guys have nothing better. There's nothing going on in the trailer park tonight. <laughs> what are you guys doing here? And it was a great situation because they get so mad, they leave, which is what you want. I don't want you there anymore. Right. You're not a good audience. But then 20 minutes into my set, they come walking back in. And I'm like, oh, God, mm. are they going to shoot up this place? <laughs> what is, I've never had this happen before. They sit back in the front row and they listen quietly mm. and laugh. It's like they got so drunk, they walked out, walked around the box, saw a comedy show was going on. I was like, well, let's huh. check this yeah. out. <laughs> they totally forgot. Yeah, totally <laughs> forgot they were even thrown out in the first place. And then they were the best audience the rest of the night. So sometimes you go head to head with them. It works out. Does your, does your kid think you're funny? Uh, yeah, he's yeah, a, good. he thinks I'm funnier than anybody, <laughs> even people in Wichita. <laughs> Do you try material out on him? Or uh, you like no. practice to him? No, <laughs> my material on him is so bad. It's just it's just fart jokes. You're just naturally <laughs> <It's>, funny. <laughs> I know kids laugh so easy. It's they're so easy. So I've got a lot of questions about a lot of different comedians because I am a fan of comedy and I've listened to it since I'm older than you, so I've listened to it since I was a little kid. But one um, question I have is so. Kevin Hart is in the news recently, mm -hmm. and he, for those of you that, that don't know, he was going to host the Oscars, I believe, yeah. and then he they dug up a joke he made 
eight years ago, a, a gay joke. Yeah. And he had to apologize for it. He withdrew from being host. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe not like talking about specifically him, but but there's so much that every comedian says things that are offensive to someone. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Like, why did that happen to him? Because he seems like such a good guy and yeah. a guy who's not, you know, necessarily, you know, offensive generally. Yeah. You know, he, obviously he curses or something like that. But so why do you think that happened to him and it doesn't happen to other comedians that, you know what I mean? Because people have, when I grew up, I listened to Eddie Murphy Delirious. It's one of my favorite things yeah. growing up. That is so bad compared to what Kevin Hart did. Yeah. And Eddie Murphy in his later years is kind of celebrated now yeah. and, you know, and won an Oscar, you know what I yeah. mean? Things like that. So why did, and does that make you fearful about what you say, you know? Yeah. And how, when you write things, do you worry about, oh, you know, Megan Welch said this and now she won't get hired to yeah. play these places, you know? Now, I've said, I've already said things that I've lost, I lost a gig uh, making a joke um, at, a, at a, a private corporate party uh, where I make a joke about leaving my kid in the car. Mm -hmm. Just being like, yep, yeah. I'm here, my kid's in the car. It's just a quick little thing. Uh, and that was the first like thing out of my mouth. And the rest of the show I thought went well, but the people that hired me were so offended by that. They were like, he's in the car. I'm like, that was a joke. I would right. never leave my kid in the car unattended yeah like i've left my kid in the car at an open mic but there was another comic hanging out with him <laughs> until i got off stage yeah but which obviously kevin hart was making a joke i mean he's a comedian that's he's what he comedian. does he makes jokes and he was making jokes and i know there was several several uh homophobic tweets that he had made uh my understanding of that situation though was that he had already apologized but i don't since then uh nick cannon i don't know if you saw came yeah. out and fa dug up treat, uh, tweets that uh, Amy Schumer and yeah. Sarah Silverman had said using the the yeah. F word um, and those. And uh, that's the thing is uh, so many people, <laughs> they push back against like PC culture and with comedy especially. We should be able to say whatever we want. There should be no lines. We should push those. I think you have a problem uh, now with people, there's so much control. You can control celebrities so easily. Right. James Gunn lost his job with Disney over some tweets. That's the thing. We're digging up tweets mm -hmm. from old things people have done. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I said horrible things when I was in middle school and high school. <laughs> uh, two friends of mine. Every single person has said something. Said something that as was, bad as did not Hart. hold up. Time did not hold up the things right. that I used to say. The, the funny, the, not fu I guess it was funny. One of the things I saw about that that made me laugh was make sure that you don't say anything offensive eight years ago. Yeah. You yeah, know, that's like ago. if you <laughs> if you go back in time and delete everything you've ever said that yeah. was offensive to your, and I've said a horrible, I have a friend uh, that is gay and in high school, I used to say it was just a joke to call him right. that, you know, as my buddy. So, uh, and I think most people agree. Like I think, 90% or more of mm -hmm. the culture agrees with what we're saying. Yeah. But somehow, whether there's a small, there's a small percentage that are offended or the 90% are so afraid of a few people yeah. that it turns this thing upside down and it makes us work. So I've heard but comedians talk about not wanting to work on college campuses before. Yeah. And Greg was just in here earlier talking about uh, comedians sometimes have to sign things that they're not going to make jokes about certain things on mm -hmm. college campuses. Yeah. Like, and then now that's just driving comedians away from working on campuses. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I think there used to be a, uh, like before social media, people used to, celebrities, I have to live my whole life in this limelight and it's hard. You got paparazzi, people finding out when you're going through a divorce. Then social media happens and celebrities are pushed right side by side with the rest of society and culture mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, every thought they think is right on the internet, yep. and then you are allowed to go on your keyboard and tell them they're horrible and all their movies suck and that they never should have been born. And it gives people to, there's like this weird, we shouldn't be this close to 
We shouldn't be this close <laughs> to our idols, honestly. We shouldn't. I don't want to yeah. know everything Kevin Hart thinks. I don't want to know everything that people say right. at the bar and then tweet on. Like, oh, that was a fight. Athletes are the same way because I've known a lot of news reporters who, you know, they'll be interviewing an athlete and this athlete has a certain image. And, you know, they'll tell me, it's like, oh, this is a terrible human being. Yeah. But they know what to say when they're on camera. Yeah. But as soon as that camera's off, they are treat you horrible or they're, you know, rude yeah. or things like that, you know. So it's a, it's an image, you know. Yeah. But they've crafted it. They know when to say things and when not to say things because there's, you know, like that. But, and, you know, they, and then the athletes, now you have them on Twitter just like a comedian. And mm -hmm. sometimes they do stupid things on, you know, social media and they. I don't, I think social media is cool in a lot of ways. Um but it, it's the same, it, nothing good comes out of it. Look at Pete yeah. Davidson oh, yeah. and going through all of his, you know, he dated somebody who was extremely popular and her fans are all over. And now he's got people telling him to kill himself on social media. Yeah. And he came out the other day and was like, quit bullying me. And people yeah. are making fun of it. Like, you can't was, say was, anything. He's the guy on Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. So he was the one that made fun of the... Um, uh, Senator with or whoever the with the eye patch. Eye. Yeah. That turned out good because they ended up, that guy came on Saturday Night Live and made fun of him. Yeah. That, that ended up, I thought, being funny. But at first it was, but it was a result of kind of everybody like going after him because he made a joke about He made a guy. joke about a guy with one eye and I get that he lost it in the war. Yeah. But it's like, it's just a joke at the end of the day. It's yeah. like, so Pete's is there... da dad is, uh, he died in 9-11, so I yeah. feel like he is a patriot, you know? Like, yeah. we don't have to question every... I Getting back to Kevin Hart, though, yes. I feel like things you say, it could be, like, they're going to get drug out. And, and, and there's so many, and there's no celebrity out there. Tom Hanks has said something horrible, I right. swear. He's maybe smarter about not having a social media to put it on. Yeah. But I don't know that it's exactly like, I consider myself an ally of the LGBT community. Um, and I consider myself a person that is, that likes like PC culture, that mm -hmm. understands it to a way right. and understands that I'm sorry if someone says, this hurts and I don't want it said anymore. If it's racial, if it's homophobic, if people come out and they say, I'm done with this, I don't want this anymore, then we as humans respecting other humans, we don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm not, I'm not a homosexual, but if I was, or if, if someone tells me like, don't say this and I don't understand how it hurts and I just go away, oh, it hurts them. I'm not going to say it. I yeah. don't want to hurt other human beings. I do understand going through and looking at this and demanding apologies for things if you want to. If you were like eight years ago, he, he said this a hundred times. He had some pretty bad ones in yeah. there. It wasn't just like he used the word. I think at one point he said he'd kill his kid if he was gay. But Which is an obvious joke. It's an obvious joke. You know, but yeah. yeah. So. But Which I think, to me is different than, let's say, Louis C.K. Yeah. So now Louis C.K. who said probably way worse things in his comedy. Yeah. He did personally something terrible. Yeah. But nobody's upset at his comedy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's probably said worse things than Kevin Hart he's generally had, through had the years. He's had a jokes and stuff. Yeah. Like yeah. But that's not what they're focused on no. with him. It's such a odd thing. It's, to me, it's like, here's a guy or a girl who is successful. We're going to try to tear her down, tear yeah. him down as best we can. No matter what they did, it was bad. Mm -hmm. You know? And, um, and then you know, try to come through. Because I saw Louis kind of started back up again and people mm -hmm. are upset that he hasn't really... He should be. You know, apologized. Or he just yeah. kind of showed up in a comedy store, or wherever. He's going to have a hard time, but it's honestly probably how it should be. Like, people will ask me all the time, do I think that Louis C.K. should be doing comedy still? And personally, as a woman, uh, I think he should have been sidelined for a lot longer Honestly, I feel like uh, he could curb a lot of careers with doing what he did. Mm -hmm. he, it, he took a lot of advantage over women in a power. And I love Louis C.K. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that I can't, he shouldn't ever do comedy again. I don't think that. So what all. is I the, think, like, I think right the way he wants do? to do it now, I think is probably the best way he could do it. Because now his first appearance back, he didn't announce. He surprised an audience. Yep. It went well. And then they were like, okay, they're announcing now, mm -hmm. and he's going back in and working, like, the cellar and stuff. Yeah. And uh, what I read and hear is that he's getting a lot of people showing up to heckle him and good mm -hmm. on him. And that's good for you because if you want to come back, then you're just going to have a long road upward to right. try to earn people's respect again. And you battle hecklers after every night. 
I guess people were telling him to pull his penis out the last time he was on stage and just yelling at it mm -hmm. that through. And good, do that. Right. He shouldn't have it easy. Yeah. He shouldn't. He made life hard for a lot of people. And just because you're talented doesn't give you the excuse, doesn't mean that the world should just follow in right. your lap. You want to come back, it's going to, don't make it easy for it's, him. And so I agree with you in that. And some people, even more extreme, I guess, of that would say he shouldn't do it. What you're saying is he yeah. should do. He should have every right to go up there and do whatever he wants he's to do. Comedian. But he's got to deal with the consequences. Yeah. Just like you know anybody else would in another job. He made he did something horrible, and I feel like everybody should have a chance to own up to that mistake and and, and grow from it and right. learn from it. I don't think he's going to be pulling women into his dressing room again. I, I think he'd be an idiot if he did. You know, um, he's probably going to deal with that and realize when he comes back that he's people are going to be watching him and waiting for him to screw up. Mm -hmm. I think that if you have a dream and you've learned from your mistakes, you should be able to chase that dream and, and accomplish whatever you want. Uh, but with him, I, I think the best thing he can do is go and battle hecklers for a year in a club and then show people like, I really want to do this and I'm really sorry for what I did. Mm -hmm. And that guy yelling at me right now, I understand why and I'm going to own up to that and deal with it. I think the hard thing for people to generally get about comedians is the, it, it's an act mm -hmm. even though it seems very natural yeah you know like you've you've said i've do this a hundred times i would change the words here it's not i'm just standing up there and talking this is a well-crafted a lot of hard work goes into this just like an actor in a movie yeah you know so if someone's making a joke or someone's talking about a topic just like someone would play a role in a movie you know i, I think it's hard for people to think those are similar because yeah. com stand up comedy is such a conversational like the way you're talking to me sounds like the way you talk to an audience yeah this is not prepared yeah it's almost identical you know what i mean yeah. so i think for people that might not be in comedy or understand that or really have studied that i think it's hard for them to you know disassociate the two Does yeah some people don't get the act at all yeah even when you're doing good you know uh people will come up and be like wow like sometimes uh it's hard to like someone will come up and be like, you're so real. Like you, that was so honest what you were saying up there. I'm like, yeah. there was only 10% of that that was honest. Yeah. Like it starts from a place of honesty and then I elaborate and exaggerate mm -hmm. from there, yeah. you know, but people don't, sometimes they, they don't separate the act and the person. And sometimes yeah. you have, you have to do that. Speaking of Louis, I've, I've seen him, I saw him once and the, the joke that he made of himself of comedy, he was, saying, so last night, actually it wasn't last night, I just made this up, and then he went into the joke, you know what I mean? So it was setting up a joke like yeah. that actually happened, and then he just said, obviously it didn't happen, I'm making all this Pulling stuff. Pulling the curtain, being like, this is yeah. the bones of this. Yeah, and it's so fine. I think that's so common. So, Some, so talk about, like, have you, how much traveling do you do? How often do you work? Mm -hmm. uh, are you, you know, are you trying to go to New York, Los Angeles? What's the future of what you're trying to do do you have a plan more than this week where you're going yeah um I, right now i like working on the road and tra uh, getting to do that as much as possible i mainly work in the midwest and then uh started working down like more moving towards the south mm -hmm. this summer uh i um, did zanies in nashville which is an awesome comedy yeah. club it was really cool the week i was there the next week gilbert godfrey was there nice. so it was that's yeah, awesome it's a really cool club they have in nashville and i did um Went to Chattanooga, Atlanta, uh, did a brewery show out in a little small town in Carleton, Georgia. It was an amazing show. Uh, went and did a show in Memphis. So uh, I like traveling and going and branching out as far as possible. That's kind of like what I'm doing each year. I try to look at where I where I toured last year or where I was on the road, and then I try to expand on that and see, okay, let me try to get into this club. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just adding either clubs or networking with other comedians that run a show in their town, you know, mm -hmm. and trying to go go that way, you know, sending, and then trying to bring, and here in Wichita, I run my own shows too, and I try to bring in touring comics as well. Mm -hmm. Like I have uh, Patrick Cunningham, who's a really funny Alabama comic coming through in January on the 13th at Shamrock Lounge, and it's, uh, Olivia Grace is going to be back in the spring, and she's from Comedy Central's Roast Battle, and I met her, and we're bringing her in. So uh, it's just you meet people when you're on the road. You do comedy festivals, network with people, and then it seems hopefully like the, grow comedy here in Wichita where we get cool acts coming through. It yeah. seems like 
comedians love to hang out with comedians mm -hmm. and there's a good culture and it seems like generally are helpful to each other. Is yeah. that, is that true? Exactly. In our, in our world, I'm getting ready to go next week to San Antonio to uh, our national coaches convention. And it's just a bunch of track. There's a thousand track coaches there and we're all trying to help each other out. You yeah, know what I mean? And even though we are competing with each other for recruits, we're yeah. trying to beat them at the different meets that we go to, but we are legitimately wanting to help each other, whether it's a young coach mm -hmm. come up in the profession or, you know, maybe we're trying to help um, somebody get a job over here. You can try yeah. to connect people that we know, you know. Do you like hanging out with other? Uh, yeah, it's like who you want to hang out with. Yeah. Like we just sit there. I mean, if, if any coach ever has a girlfriend or a wife, whenever that person gets with another coach, it's that's all that you're talking. You're not, you're ignored everyone else. Yeah. The, the, I had a guy on a podcast, Cole Davis. He was on our first podcast, and he coaches at Friends. And the joke, like, his, he's got a girlfriend. And, you know, whenever she comes with us and him after a track meet, like, if they go to meet, we go to meet. We meet up at Saturday night, mm -hmm. and we start talking. She know, she doesn't hardly probably come out with us anymore because yeah. she knows he's not going to talk to her. Yeah. He's going to talk to me. We're going to talk about track for the next three hours. Yeah. And we could do it for the next 12 hours. Yeah. And it wouldn't matter if there was a – perfect 10 supermodel standing there interested in both of us we wouldn't be interested in talking to her we'd be wanting to hey how did your girl do in the 800 this weekend you know what i mean that was that's what we do that's a i i would say hanging out with comedians is very similar but sometimes it's the worst <laughs> it's the worst now you get you get a group five comedians in a room together and we're all just trying to talk over the edge gotcha. other you know yeah. trying to tag i wasn't even doing a joke someone's trying to tag it at the yeah. end of it i'm like i'm not doing a bit right now <laughs> I don't need that tag, I don't, you know, but then sometimes like uh, I have a lot of, uh, I started, I met some comics, uh, they have a really great scene in Fayetteville and I love all the comedians down there and those guys have become like, you know, there's some of my really good friends now. So on Facebook, we're joking around with each other when I go down and there's a comedy club uh, I started working called The Grove in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. When I'm down there, they all come out, we go out, we have some drinks, it's fun, it's not you know, no one's trying to one up the other person. Right. Uh, Kansas City, I have a lot of friends that do comedy there. I love getting to go down there and do it. And in Wichita too, like when we get together now, sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes with comedians, it's just exhausting. You're like, oh my God, I feel <laughs> like I'm, I'm just trying to be, I'm, everybody's trying to be the funniest person in the room. Right. Sometimes it's easier when you're with a bunch of non-comics, I'm killing yeah. it, hmm. killing it at the bar. People are like, that's so funny. I'm like, yeah, that's because there's no other comedian here to ruin it. <laughs> that's that's funny. So, Kurt is over there. I don't know. Are, are Kurt, are you on mic today? Yep. Mike oh, there's, there's Kurt. So I saw a few things. I sent them to Kurt, and I'm going to see what you think of these. So there's kind of keeping it with the funny thing. There's a – have you seen the giant cow? Did you see that? It was What country was that in, Kurt? Was, um, was that New Australia? Maybe it's Australia. So Maybe you have a Australia. picture of that giant – look at this right here. Look how large <laughs> – that thing is um, and how does that happen i don't that's a dairy cow too right that's a female yeah i mean that's humongous it's not a fixed you know like it wasn't like uh photoshopped in there people that are on uh uh I, itunes right now that can't see this it's a cow that's twice as large as everyone else oh my god i just it's found that crazy of cows. That weird. um Say, are those uh so that's a hard cow to breed with <laughs> Uh, Some got to be demasculating to be around. <laughs> Some more material a, for you. You're a bull. Uh, so I grew up in racing, and I raced go karts growing up, and uh, it was kind of what I wanted. To, before a runner, I was uh, a racer, and I, I watched racing, and there was an insane wreck. So in Formula One is a racing circuit around the world, and then there's Formula Three, which is a minor league. Check out this crash coming from the right to the left. Did you see that? Oh, my God. So this was a girl, actually, race car driver, and it's going to come from down the bottom left and here. She's a teenager, and it's, too. Yeah, a young girl who's got launched into that. Oh my, get, is that a bus? What is that? That's a like a scaffolding for some ah. TV or something like that. No one was killed, by the way. Okay. And not even the driver? Not the driver, no. And... She's okay, I think, and she's already racing again, I, I believe. But I've never seen something like that happen. That was like my mom's worst fear. How does something racing. like that happen? In so racing? if you notice, she went backwards. Can you play that again? And if you notice, she went backwards into this. So she got turned around, just a little bit farther back, down here, got hit 
spun around and is going backwards into the... Oh, my God. Yeah. Crazy. Real funny way to kill the momentum there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so going back to the uh, things you can and can't say. So I don't know if you're uh, a vegan or any. Or I used not. to be. Okay. So uh, what's is there a vegan? And, and PETA came out with these terms of stop that they want you to stop using. Oh, okay. The offensive terms yeah, of animals. Yeah, so suit. kill two birds with one stone. They want you to say feed two birds with one scone. <laughs> Shut up. This isn't real. This is, is this real? This is really from... With a blue check mark. <laughs> Words matter. And as our understanding of social justice evolves, our language evolves along with it. Here's how to remove speciesism from your daily conversation. All right. That's what we got. All one right. says be the guinea pig. The other one, the proper thing to say is be the test tube. Beat a dead horse, feed a fed horse. All right. Bring home the bacon, bring home the bagels. All right. Take the bull by the horns, take the flower by the thorns. This As a comedian, this has, I mean, you've got to make a joke about this. No, this, is, this cracks me up because uh, it's like Pete, they're, they're either the best comedians in the world or uh, they don't understand it. <laughs> like they, it's like they don't understand that they're, people already make fun of them already. Everything right. they do is ridiculous. I love that they're like, we're, we got Kevin Hart over here that's, you know, we, he's losing his job <laughs> for homophobic slurs. And you're over here like, all right, while well, we're fixing homophobia, right. can we also work on kill bir two birds with one stone? But see, if you, you're feeding birds with a scone, that's unhealthy for the birds because yeah, think of all the kill, sugar yeah. in that you know for you the, could kill a bird easily with yes, a scone honestly I mean, one you know, scone come on pita i Gosh. could kill 20 birds with one scone if they want to yeah didn't have to be that big of a scone i think that's really uh i like that they're tweeting that out like i like that it, it would makes be great me think that they April think April people Day. take them seriously yeah. you know like i like that, that there's somebody naive enough to be like no we're gonna fix this yeah. be like well <laughs> what about you know there's genocide in africa no <laughs> We're going to fix this first. <laughs> uh, Bring home the bagels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell that to your husband sometime. Uh, it's bringing home the bacon. That's uh, that's a money. That's for money, right? You're bringing home the bacon. Correct. You bring it home. Yes. I don't think bagel translates well. I don't either. Uh, so our throws coach, we don't have much track and field on this, but our throws coach, John Hetzendorf, recently, there's been this thing going around all the NCAA track and field throws coaches. They do this thing called the weight pentathlon mm -hmm. challenge and they throw there's five throwing events in track and field and our coach who was a world-class javelin thrower did this competition now he's in his 40s and he hasn't thrown these events in decades and so this is watching videos now this is the hammer throw and he about ripped his finger off when he did that one oh, so that's the hammer this is the shot put so that's john hetzendorf former world championship uh competitor in the javelin by the way and uh, here's his shot put. This one probably looks the best of all of them. And he was excited. Then this is discus. And Man. And he would be embarrassed that I'm showing this. You see how he was hurting there at the end. Javelin, this was his event. And he was hurting. His elbow about fell off when he threw that one. Where is he competing right now? That's, uh, that's at our facility. Oh. Uh, and then this is the weight throw. So this is the indoor version of the hammer. So those are the five... That's a 35-pound weight that he's throwing. Now, he's throwing about, you know, two-thirds the distance of our kids now, but he used to be a terrific athlete. This, is, this would be like if you didn't tell a joke for 15 years, mm -hmm. and, then, and then they put your jokes on YouTube the first time that you went out there yeah. with, with no preparation. That would be horrible. So that's what that would be. Not to, I don't know if he's, I don't, it's not. My mom's a, she's a track and field coach. Oh, yeah? She threw the discus in college. And, Where's she uh, coach? She coaches middle school track and field at Andover Central. Oh, sweet. So maybe one day you'll get one of her Yes, we may already have, there. have had some of them. I, awesome. She always wanted me to throw the javelin when yeah. I was in high school. And uh, I wasn't, it's just. Wasn't it's your a, thing? It's a finesse, like, you know, it's a technical, like, you're, you know, I don't know. It's not just like hurling stuff. There's more to it than that. Oh, yeah. It just took too much. It's tough. Dedication. If you ever want to, we won't, we won't put these videos up, but if you ever need some late night entertainment, just. Google or YouTube uh, javelin injuries because you'll see there's oh, been geez. officials getting hit with javelins throughout track and field. So just like speared. Yes, yes, that happens every once in a while. You'll find these crazy videos. So okay, we in we always end talking about movies. And first thing I was going to ask you, what do you think about? If you, are there movies about 
comedians mm. that pr you particularly connect with. There's track and field movies out there that are some of the favorite movies I've ever had because yeah. of a track person. Um, I can think of some that I've seen. Are there any movies about comedians or about your profession mm. that you love? Or One of my favorites, uh, my, my favorite of all time is a Jerry Seinfeld's Comedian. Yeah. It is the greatest. If you want to know, it's such a good look at, if you want to know what it's like to be a comedian, or if you want to know, because there's two sides of it. There's Orny Adams yep. on one side who's just starting out and starting to pick up momentum. And then there's Jerry who's going back on the, he's trying so to redevelop a new Seinfeld. act. So this was after Seinfeld. This was after an act. He yep. retired his act. He did, and I have that on DVD, the Jerry, Sein, I'm telling you for the last time. Mm -hmm. He retires that act. And then he's like, I'm going to do a, I'm going to make a new hour. So he's recrafting and going you could watch jerry seinfeld bomb and comedy mics yeah. which is like when you think oh every comedian is just always funny it's like no you're developing acts mm -hmm. and then orny adams in that movie is this starting out comic and you're like everybody hates him he's the yeah. bad guy of the movie because he's so arrogant and he's yeah. so everything he wants and he wants it right now and i remember talking about that with another comedian in town uh and uh biggs and he was say he said you didn't like Orny Adams? And I was like, no, I absolutely hated him after the first time I watched it. And he goes, yeah, do you think there may be something in you that hates a little bit of yourself? Because I think Orny Adams is a good representation of everybody who wants to be a comedian. Mm -hmm. You just want it so bad, you right. know, that they, there's this, and you lose sight. And so, the, so now I watch it and yeah. I feel sorry for Orny Adams, yeah. who has a great career, way better than me, <laughs> who's still touring and stuff, but yeah. still put him. Uh, there's also Dying Laughing, uh, which is a really good documentary. And then I like uh, I like funny people. I like Adam mm -hmm. Sandler's funny people with Seth Rogen. And I can't think, what's the name of Robert De Niro's movie? The it's called The Comedian. The Comedian, yeah. yeah. What did you think about, he wasn't a stand-up, but he was playing a stand-up. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that movie, actually, and I thought he was pretty good. He a lot went of people in and did some mics, too, at the cellar and stuff yeah. to prepare for that role. I yeah. heard that he was really just hanging out. But I think that shows you how much acting is involved in stand-up comedy oh, yeah. and then how many comedians have become actors. Yeah. I mean, there's so many. For a while, that's what you did. You were a stand-up comedian so you could get a TV show so you back could get in the day, it. like yeah. Seinfeld, mm -hmm. as an example. Yeah, so a lot of people use that as Is a there a comedian, before we get back in the movies, is there a comedian that you saw in person that was just flat out best one that rises to the top? I've seen Dave of. Chappelle twice now. Oh. Yeah. So, I mean, like, he's always going to be up at the top. Yeah. Uh, I've seen Dave Chappelle twice. Um trying to think who compares to that. I've seen Louis Black, who's great. Uh, I never did get to see Louis live. Um, he was great. Yeah. So I saw him. I saw Jerry Seinfeld. And the one that I saw in the old Looney bin over here on uh, 21st Street mm -hmm. was Norm MacDonald. Norm MacDonald is amazing. It was 20 bucks. Yeah. It was, I went, and here's the thing about him. He he told about a 30-minute joke. You were talking about having the punchline. He's yeah. totally different, obviously. Yeah. And... People were leaving because they didn't understand his comedy. You yeah. know, it's not for everybody. But they thought, oh, this is a guy on Saturday Night Live. And yeah. he's probably really funny. But he was, him not being funny is being funny. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he told a 30-minute joke that had no punchline at the end. Yeah, and people were so upset. And I'm over there dying laughing because it's, he's hilarious to me. Yeah. And uh, that was his whole thing. He was just trying to annoy everyone or yeah. something. I think, I think he might have been making up half of it because he's such a crazy yeah, guy weird, you know yeah, he was talking about wichita like he was just yeah. you know talking about the the line man of wichita yeah and he just i have a feeling he just made that up today yeah. because he was in a different city yesterday yeah. you know and talked about his fam the line man's family and all his thoughts and as the people were driving by seeing this line you know the song yeah. in the wichita yeah line wichita man. Line man. yeah so anyways he he was really good seinfeld yeah it was really there's good, also great. uh crashing on hbo is pete holmes's show okay. about him it's kind of like loosely based on how he started out in comedy but it, i mean it is the season three is getting ready to come out and um if you have hbo go or whatever i recommend crashing so it's one of my favorite just cool. seeing pete holmes who's the sweetest guy probably in comedy uh and just a really wholesome lovable character and just seeing him like artie lang yeah. is his best friend in the show mm -hmm. so seeing these two opposite guys you got artie lang and pete holmes who's like used to be a youth pastor you know <laughs> and uh it's just a really good it shows like what it's like i guess to do comedy in new york have you seen any movies mm -hmm. recently that are out in the theater last week i was in little rock and the headliner wanted to see fantastic beast the new one that's okay. out and i told her i was like 
I haven't seen the first one and I've yeah. never read the books. I know Harry Potter. Yeah. And she's like, well, you know Harry Potter. It's fine. I haven't seen him either. I've heard we don't need to. And uh, if you haven't seen fan to the second or the first Fantastic Beast, don't see the second. It is very confusing. I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and there's a lot that happened apparently in the first film that has led to this film. So it's Fantastic Beasts, a Harry Potter. It's a it's pre it's pre Harry Potter. This so is how much I know. I saw like, the first yeah. Harry Potter. I was forced to watch it. Yeah. And I didn't see any other ones. Oh man. I haven't. Yeah. I uh, no, the Fantastic Beasts is set when Dumble. It's like young Dumbledore okay. before, like in Harry Potter when he's in class. One of the books in his class he's assigned is Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And uh, it was written by this new, and that is the story of how that textbook came to be. And this guy, and this, mm, the, the author of that is, a <laughs> yeah. I don't get to see cool movies anymore. I will say, once you have kids, I, I see a lot of yeah. comic book movies oh, yeah. and kids' movies now, and now in theaters. I'll watch mm -hmm. movies, I watch a lot Netflix, HBO, Hulu, all those mini series and stuff, yeah. game changers. The best well, movie I've seen in a while is I've got Godless. no kids, so I watch uh, any movie that I can. That I have a gigantic, stupid movie collection that I'm going through alphabetically, and uh -huh. these are some of the ones I've seen recently. But, Kurt, have you seen anything recently? Uh, I saw Creed 2 last week. Right? Creed 2. I want to see Creed 2. So what do so you think of Creed 2? I saw it, too. Oh, uh, I liked it. I mean, I'm a kid of the 80s, so I saw Rocky IV, you know, the day it came out. Yes. Know, and uh, Which is in Creed two. Yeah. He fights Drago's uh, yeah. kid. Yeah. Yeah. So they did a nice job kind of, you know, you know I, I love the Rocky touching films. that and uh, just the juxtaposition of, you know, instead of Creed going to Russia to train, he goes to the desert. You know, they just right. flip the script on that. But yeah, there's some gaps in the storyline you could drive a truck through, but it's it's still pretty good. So I I really like the first Creed movie. Because uh, it was a cool idea, I yeah. thought, and and they did a good job with it, and and this was good. I thought I love the idea of them, of Drago's son, and who you know Drago killed Apollo Creed, uh -huh. in the, you know I thought that was a great idea, and people that know me are gonna laugh, but I think the problem with the second one is when they went too much into the relationship and love story of Creed. It, people watch the Rocky and Creed movies to see the fights, to see the training montages, to see him chase a chicken around the backyard. Like, you know I mean? That's why you go watch those yeah. movies. And even like the original Rocky movies, when it went to the love story with him and Adrian, that was when it lost me. It was like, yeah, I, I get it. it. You know what I mean? But Doesn't every boxing movie have that though? Like it Cinderella does. Man, you have the home life. Yes. You gotta know what they're fighting for. I hate that. For. I don't wanna and see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyways, Creed 2 was solid, but it wasn't as good as Creed 1, or just Creed, I guess. Um, but yeah, the last movies I've seen in this crazy DVD collection, one that's a comedy, How to Be a Latin Lover. Have you ever seen this movie? No. I'd never seen it. I bought it on a whim. It's got this guy, uh, Hey, who, Henio, Derbez, however you say his name. Is that uh, the Rob guy Lowe. From Overboard? I think it might have been. But he's in um, he's in a couple other movies recently. This is a funny movie. It's actually kind of a family movie, too. Okay. It's got some adult humor because he's uh, a guy who, as a 20 year old, married an old, rich, like 50 year old woman to try to be a you know gold digger. Yeah. And then she breaks up with him when he's like 50. Yeah. You know, and now he's trying to find another, you know, old rich woman and he's got no skills left at that point but it's it's pretty funny movie how to be a latin lover most people probably wouldn't check it out um you know because of the name of the title yeah but it's but it's really funny i'll have to check that out uh watch the hurt locker have you ever seen the hurt locker uh -huh. great movie so in the h's obviously in this uh movie yeah. question so one of my favorite movies uh you know not funny at all <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Hurt Locker, uh, Hustle and Flow was one of my favorite movies. Hustle Flow, have is you great. seen Hustle yeah. and Flow? Yeah, Three Six Mafia. <laughs> oh my gosh, so good! And a uh, couple things that are surprising about this movie. So, for people that haven't seen it, it's a movie about a pimp who wants to be a rapper. Yeah, and you think that's kind of a, you know not very inspiring, but it's kind of actually an inspiring movie. You yeah. know, and I think of uh, you know struggling through his. You know, everybody can relate to that, struggling yeah. in their career path, and they put it in that uh, world of being a pimp. Yeah. And two things to me they're surprised about, Terrence Howard, who's the main guy, yeah. is the opposite of what his character is in real life. Like, he's he's a, like a country music singer, and he's a, you know, uh, very different accent, you yeah. know, and all this kind of stuff. And then the guy who wrote and directed is a white guy, mm -hmm. who is, a, is about his life as a movie director. Yeah. He made it in the music, in the... 
uh, hustle. Hustle and flow. So I great, like that because in movie. 2018, it's like it's the life of a human trafficker who wants to be on SoundCloud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> SoundCloud rappers. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think you got some new material. Yeah. Uh, a couple other ones, uh, or, or last one, because we talked about Creed. There's this movie called Christine. Um, not that, so it's a different Christine. So pull up Christine 2016. Oh. Is uh, it the remake of this? No, it's oh. it's it's about. It, it's weird that it has the same title as that 1980s horror movie Christine, but Christine is about a um, woman who is a news reporter who committed suicide on live television. It was the first ever, oh, okay. you know, uh, there it is. And uh, so she was a woman who was kind of frustrated in her job. And it was at the time, it was in, I think in the 70s, like in the mid 70s, and they were trying to sensationalize the news. And before it was just, you know, just news. Yeah. And, and so they were trying to get ratings and they were needing, you know, sponsors. So they would want her to find controversial stories. And she kind of got frustrated with that. There was a love triangle always. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had depression and struggled. And she, this is a, so it's based on a true story. And it was the first ever recorded suicide on television. And the story is that there is one tape of that available that is, I think the uh, family owns and they won't let anybody see it. So like, it was such a low-rated show. People didn't watch it. Nobody recorded it, obviously, in the 70s. So there is one tape of it, of her actually doing it, that no one's ever seen, unless you were watching it live unless on television. It. And people thought it was a joke when it happened. You know, they thought it was some sort of television, like, act or something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> and then they realized it wasn't, and it was for real. So fascinating story, and it's low-budget movie that wasn't released in theaters, but I'm sure it's probably on Netflix or something like that if you might want to see it. So I'll have to check it. Christine. That's it. You watch... Uh uh, um, you watch a lot of m more movies than you do like any of the TV shows and stuff because there's so Yeah, I don't TV. have Netflix. Oh, you don't have so Netflix? So I'm a dork that buys movies. Yeah. And so I prefer movies. I, I love um, shows like Curb Your Enthusiasm and, yeah. you know, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and I buy those and I'll just rewatch those. And yeah. I try not to get in a wormhole of other shows that I haven't watched. I, I do that on YouTube. Last night, I got into this crazy wormhole of watching hippopotamus attacks. Have you ever <laughs> yeah. like seen yeah. something like this? Yeah. <laughs> These are the craziest things. And so I watched that for like two hours. I couldn't sleep. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyways. so we're going to wrap up. Uh, how do people find out where you're going to be? Is there social media? Yeah. Uh, I have a Megan Welch comedy on Facebook. M-E-G-H-A-N. Yep, that's me. Uh, go there. I'm sometimes bad about posting on there now that I'm looking at those flyers <laughs> uh, it's from August. Uh, but yeah, do follow me there or follow me on Facebook. I post more to my other account. I just so just Wichita you on comedy. Facebook. Yeah, I yeah. run like I run Wichita comedy's Facebook uh, with the help of some other comedians, and then I just get so lost on. How that often bit. do you do shows in Wichita? Um, pretty often. I mean, if I'm not, if I don't have a show on a week, there's always an open mic that I'm usually at. So, uh, and we need more people at mics because like we were saying, it's practicing and you have to do it in front of people. It's not like music. I can't just yep. practice in my basement and then come wow people. I have to try out things in front of audiences. We need audiences. We'll bring the whole mics. track team. We've got 120 kids. Oh my God. Yeah. And you can rip on every single one of them. Yeah, there we go. They need <laughs> toughen them up. We need more. <laughs> yeah, we do need some college kids. We, we need more college kids in crowds. That's for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you. It was, it was fun chatting with you. So following Megan Welch, uh, funniest person in Wichita. I think you've seen some evidence of that here today. So thanks for coming and uh, have a wonderful holiday season. All right. Thank you. Uh, everybody be safe out there and uh, go Shocks.